It is seven o'clock, so we are going to get started. Hello to everybody who is joining us on the live stream over on YouTube. Um, as we go through our presentation here tonight, feel free to drop questions at any time into the chat over there at YouTube, and we will have a Q&A at the end where we'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can get to. We're going to start with our, was that the beginning? No. Aha. Here we go. Um, just a reminder that we are now holding these webinars once a month. They're on the uh, last Wednesday of the month. So today is our June 30th. And a reminder, we talked about this last time, our registration is open for Bees Academy for this year. We had a pause on Bees Academy last year. Um, so we're holding just one. The, these are classes meant for intermediate level learning. Um, they're a really great way to help prep for the journeyman exams if that's something that you're interested in. Um, we are going to be holding our Single Bees Academy this year in October in Union County. So go check us out on our website. We're ncsuapiculture.net, and we have a whole page about our Bees Academy, and there is a link there where you can register if that's something that you're interested in. So we're going to start with Bees in Season. Um, which is what our bees are doing now and what you should be thinking about as a beekeeper based on what's going on seasonally. So we're here at the end of the end of June, beginning of July for most regions in North Carolina, exceeding some of the higher elevations, the flow is ending or ended. Um, and what that means is that robbing is beginning. So uh, something I really like to emphasize is that it's great to install your robbing screens before major problems start to develop. You don't have to wait to see robbing to act. Um, additionally, honey extraction is becoming a priority for a lot of uh, beekeepers. If they haven't already, they're pulling their supers off. Um, they're extracting their honey. That's something to be careful of when we do have robbing going on because that act of pulling your supers can start a robbing frenzy and nobody wants that. Uh, make sure the bees have plenty of water. It's very hot, especially today. Um, as we go into the heat of the summer here, having access to water is really important for the bees to be able to successfully cool the hive. So if at all possible, provide them with a clean water source uh, nearby to your apiary. Um, if your resources are already low, especially if uh, maybe you got overzealous with your honey pull or anything like that, it's time to start thinking about feeding. Um, you know, as we head into the summer dearth, you really want to make sure you're not getting into a bad situation where you've got starvation in July or August uh, when it's very preventable. So keep an eye on your resources, make sure your bees have enough to, to eat, enough to maintain the brood nest. Um, and of course, it's an excellent time to start your mite counts, um, especially considering that a lot of people have pulled their honey. It's opening up some options for treatment because you don't have to worry about contaminating your supers. Really, really great time to start your mite counts. A little bit more about robbing. A question that I see very, very often, especially among new beekeepers, is, is this robbing? You know, with pictures or videos, and they say, is it orientation flights? Is it normal or is it robbing? So some of the things you're gonna be looking for to try to diagnose robbing, you see this frenzied activity at the hive with sort of visible bees coming and going. Um, you're gonna see these invaders trying to access any small gap in the hive, especially if your boxes are a little bit older um, and there are some gaps and cracks in between your hive bodies. That um, is a place that a lot of the times the robbers are gonna be trying to get in. So you see them at the seams of the boxes, you see them at the lid, um, things like that. The sound can be a little bit angry. If you're like me and you have the tendency to listen to your bees, you might hear that angry buzzing that goes on with robbing. And then if you are inspecting, especially a colony that you suspect has been robbed out, this picture on the right is really demonstrative of what you see after a colony has been robbed out. These cells are chewed open. They're emptied of anything that was in them. A lot of the time you'll find sort of like small pieces of wax debris on the bottom board that are left over from this frenzied stealing of all of the resources in the hive. So keep your eye out for robbing. Um, once it's started, it can be really hard to stop. So the best thing to do is to uh, prevent it. And robbing screens are one of the most effective ways to do that and really excellent because they don't limit the uh, ventilation at the front of the hive as much as a traditional uh, entrance reducer does. So it's a really great way to protect the entrance but still maintain that ventilation that can be important in the summertime. Um, some robbing screens that are pretty widely available are the wooden and the plastic variety. Like I said, they allow for that ventilation. You have these small protected entrances that are 
accessible by these movable parts. Um, additionally, it's best to avoid entrance feeders at this time of year. Um, in hive feeders or top feeders, it's necessary for invaders to actually make their way into the hive to try to steal from them. Whereas an entrance feeder is really accessible to anybody that comes to the front door. So um, they can institute a lot of robbing, they can cause robbing, and it can be a waste of your sugar syrup if you're feeding the neighborhood instead of the hive that you're interested in. So uh, look for those at your local bee supply if that's something that you wanna add to your apiary. Looking ahead three to six weeks from now, emphasizing again, making sure the bees have access to fresh water. It's gonna help with their attempts to cool the hive as it gets hot. We're gonna talk more about mite, count, mite counts, don't worry. So I'm just gonna keep saying mite counts over and over again. Um, don't allow the bees to starve during the dearth. Make sure you're controlling robbing. That includes maybe combining some weak colonies because if colonies are weak during the dearth, they are a target for stronger colonies for robbing. So you don't wanna leave them vulnerable. Um, and if you are the type to move your colonies, it's time to start scope out your locations for the fall flow. If you're gonna move them for, um, you know, fall flow in the mountains or anything like that, it's now's the time to start thinking about where they're gonna be located and setting up bear fences and things like that. And I am so out of order. I'm so sorry, hold on. Don't know why my PowerPoint is presenting out of order, but moving on from our bees in season to our timely topic, we're gonna talk about mite monitoring and control, which is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. If any of you guys who have joined us have ever met me or heard me speak at any of the bee meetings or seen me around town, you know that I'm always talking about mites. And contrary to popular belief where mite management is a fall problem, summer management is really the, the time you need to start thinking about Varroa. The reason that that's true is that as the dearth begins and the flow tapers off, um, colony growth also starts to slow, but mite growth does not. So at every point in the year up until now, the colony has been growing and the mite populations have been growing kind of in tandem, but now we're reaching an inflection point where that colony growth starts to fall off and the mites begin to outstrip them. And that's when you start to see those mite levels rise above that treatment threshold. The reason that mite management is so important is because varroa mites vector dangerous viruses. Um, some of them you may have heard of, some of them you may not. A couple that are of particular economic importance are de deformed wing, Israeli acute paralysis virus, the Lake Sinai viruses, and a whole suite of others. So the best thing that we can do as beekeepers to protect our colonies from these viruses are to manage our mites. Um, I can't say it enough that you should not wait for signs of trouble to monitor your mites. Um, don't wait to see mites on bees. Don't wait to see signs of disease. If you're monitoring year round, you know, you're, you're catching it before it's a serious problem, which is why there's two steps to your mite management system. First is to count, second is to act. So monitoring is something that I think doesn't get emphasized as much as it could be. A lot of the times um, we talk a lot about different ways to treat for mites or manage for mites. But we don't talk a lot about counting for mites. Um, I count mites in my colonies every month um, during the entire active season because that really gives me a sense of what's going on in the colonies while they're at their strongest, while they're in this sort of transition period, while they're in the dearth, and then even at the beginning of the winter. And that way I don't have to guess when it's time to take action. I know because I've been collecting that information. The most accurate form of mite counting would be the alcohol wash. It's very quick. Um, it's very easy. There are commercial kits that you can buy. There are also YouTube videos and online guides about how to make your own mite wash system. The real idea there is that you're going to have a container. It's very often a jar. And you're going to scoop your 300 Vs into your container. You're going to fill it with your rubbing alcohol or your windshield washer fluid or whatever you're using. And then you're going to have a mesh that is large enough for mites to fall through, but small enough that the bees will not fall through. And you're gonna invert that either into another clean jar or into a container or bottle where you can count those mites. Um, very quick, very easy to do, very easy to count because those mites are all by themselves in that liquid and it's really easy to see them, um, really excellent. Sort of the next best would be the sugar shake, which is one that I think is super common. It gets taught a lot in bee schools and things like that. It's a very similar process. You've got your jar, you're gonna scoop your 300 bees from a brood frame. You're gonna pour them into the jar. That's about a half cup of bees for anybody that's not familiar. 
you have your mesh lid that's going to be the same size, but this time, instead of filling your jar with your alcohol solution, you're going to fill your jar with an appropriate volume of powdered sugar. You're going to give it a jostle, set it long enough for the bees to start grooming. That powdered sugar is going to help dislodge the mites. Then you're going to invert that sugar jar over a light colored surface. We used a paper plate in previous experiments. I've seen beekeepers use a Frisbee. I've seen them use bucket lids. I've seen them use the tailgate of their truck, whatever works. And you can either shake that sugar um, into water if you want to help it dissolve and make it a little bit easier to see or dry if that's your preference and you don't want everything to be sticky. And then the last step is the same. You're going to count your mites. Um, what you're looking for is a count of mites per 300 bees, which you're going to divide by three to get your percent. And your percent is usually where your treatment thresholds are going to be recommended. So for this time of year, July, treatment threshold is 2%, which is six mites per 300 bees. Um, sticky boards and uh, ventilated bottom boards and things are an excellent part of your IPM plan, but they're not a suitable replacement for actual mite monitoring. So it's great to have a sticky board. It's great to use it as sort of a tool to see what's going on in your colony. But even with a sticky board, you still need to be either alcohol washing or sugar shaking your bees on a semi-regular basis to get a sense of your mite levels. Um, and I'm going to say it again, you absolutely should not wait to see mites on bees before you start thinking about this. If you are seeing mites on bees, that's typically indicative that the mite levels in the colony are extremely high. So do not wait for that. As far as management, there's a lot of really great resources available here. Um, one of my personal favorites is the Honey Bee Health Coalition. Um, they have an entire guide on Varroa and how to count Varroa and how to treat for Varroa and things like that. That link is at the top of this slide. Um, really awesome resource. I like it a lot. Again, I'm going to talk mostly about the summer season because that's what we're in right now. You've got some different options for chemical treatment. Apivar is your synthetic treatment. You absolutely cannot use this when there are honey supers on the colony. So this is only for you if you've already removed your supers. It does not have a temperature limit like some of the organic acids do. So you can use it even in the heat of the summer. Formic acid, which most typically right now is sold as Formic Pro, is an organic acid treatment. You can use it when supers are on the colony, but you cannot use it when temperatures are higher than 92 Fahrenheit. So that temperature limit becomes a problem in July and August here in our area. Um, you've got to be aware of that because if you're using Formic when it's too hot, you're going to either kill the colony, kill the queen, or really knock back the brood, and nobody wants that. Another organic acid option is Thymol, which is typically sold under the name Apigard when you're buying it in the patties. Um, this again, cannot be used when supers are on the colony. It's not approved for use when you have supers on. And it has a little bit of a higher temperature threshold. You can use that up to 105 Fahrenheit. Um, some non-chemical methods that can be implemented include brood breaks. This can be by you know, requeening or walkaway splits or anything like that. Um, removal of drone comb is another way to mitigate your mite levels, especially if you're using drone frames in your colony. Um, and then a method that I'm honestly not as familiar with, but has been talked about a lot, is this new heat treatment method. That's something that I'm still waiting to read more data on before I make any sort of real recommendations or opinions on it. But I know that it's something that's uh, being used, that's been approved for use in, in bee colonies. So also a non-chemical method that's out there. Um, in other seasons, some of your other management options include oxalic acid. Oxalic acid is not an appropriate chemical to use right now because colonies are not broodless. Oxalic is only labeled for use for mite prevention and mite control when colonies are broodless or nearly broodless, which here is going to be pretty much exclusively in the winter. So we do not recommend oxalic acid for use in the summer or fall for mite control. Um, and then another option that's really worth considering is requeening with hygienic stock. If you find yourself having a lot of trouble managing your mites, it might be time to think about looking into something like a varroa sensitive hygienic or something like that. Some ineffective methods of mite control that we do not recommend be used alone are screen bottom boards or sticky boards. Um, mineral oil, powdered sugar dusting, or essential oils. These are not methods that are, you know, sort of developed specifically for use for mite control. You're not likely to bring yourself under treatment threshold with these methods. Um, and nobody wants to spend a lot of time and a lot of resources managing their colonies to lose them to mites when it's preventable.
And with that, I am going to turn this over to Dr. Brad Metz, who is going to introduce our guest tonight. Tonight, we have Brittany Kyle from the Honeybee Veterinary Consortium. She's the president, um, and uh, she's going to be available for Q&A at the end as well. So take it away, Brad. Hi, thanks. Um, I don't know. I just want to reiterate, because you were talking about the mites and stuff, just briefly. Uh, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to um, look at some management data where people simultaneously did sugar shakes and then just saw, observed whether or not they incidentally caught mites while they were inspecting or just working the colonies. Your threshold for spotting mites just incidentally is around 13 mites off the sugar shake. So 13%, so it's uh, ten, like five times higher or more than that, six times higher than what the re recommended treatment threshold is. So there and you go, there's some data. Be, yeah, for you to be 50-50 on catching those mites, mm -hmm. that's that. If you want to be sure, it washes out the data and the mite counts go above 20 or 30. Yeah, so it's really worth- see a mite, <laughs> it's really worth remembering that mites typically don't actually attach to bees on their backs, which is what we see looking at a frame. Mites are more typically on the underside of bees, which is another reason that you're not likely to spot them as a beekeeper, right? Usually if there's mites on the back, it's an unusual circumstance. So that's really, we want to hammer that home. You really shouldn't wait to see mites on your bees. Yep. So anyway, sorry. So um, uh, Dr. Brittany Kyle, I have the pleasure of introducing. We've spoken before in relation to um, some of her areas of academic expertise, but she is a, are you a practicing veterinarian at this point or are you currently just working on your degree or not just, but working on your degree? <laughs> yeah, I'm currently um, working on my degree in epidemiology. Um, so I'm not practicing right now. Okay. And you are also to add to, 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 to having formerly been practicing and currently working on an entomology, or epidemiology degree, uh, you were also the past, the re just recently outgoing president of the Honeybee Veterinary Consortium, right? That's correct. I was president last year. Um, our president this year is uh, Dr. Ali Mosel. She's doing a fantastic job and we work really close together. I'm still definitely um, involved with the consortium. Wonderful. Um, I, I would love, I, I hopefully we'll have time to talk a little bit about what you're studying now and because I think it's both pertinent to what we're just talking about and some of the things we were talking about before the show or the, before the meeting started, but if you could indulge me a little bit and tell us, uh, a little, uh, something about the history of the, the consortium and, and your involvement with it. Yeah, so the consortium started back in about 2017, and like most of the great things in life, it happened um, with a discussion over beer, um, and it was a bunch of veterinarians talking about the change in legislation, which suddenly was requiring veterinarians to provide oversight of all antibiotic use for the antibiotics that are medically important for humans in honeybees, and although this is great in theory, um, veterinarians really weren't prepared for the legislative change. It's not something that I ever learned about in vet school, um, or, nor none of my colleagues. And so the discussion was about how there was a lack of education for veterinarians on bees. And, and suddenly vets were going to be making treatment decisions, but they weren't necessarily prepared to do so. So the consortium started with the mission of providing really great continuing education to veterinarians. And now we're also working on trying to get a lot more education available to veterinary students so that when students graduate, they're prepared to go out and go and inspect a colony. And they are knowledgeable about particularly the bacterial diseases, but about Varroa as well, because every time you're in a colony, it's a chance to, to tackle the mites. Um, so, so our main goal is, is really surrounding um, education. And it started as, um, I think there was five original um, guys that were discussing the consortium all out of North Carolina. So we have our, our roots in, in North Carolina there. Um, and they met up with two other um, vets that were interested in, in organizing sort of a database so that 
beekeepers could find veterinarians that have knowledge about bees. Um, and uh, the consortium formed. And in 2018, we had our first uh, conference at uh, NC State University with great support from um, Dave Tarpey and the lab, as well as the um, all of the NC State uh, inspectors. And um, we had our, our conference again in 2019 at NC State. And we've Growing now, we're about uh, around 300 uh, veterinary members and veterinary student members in our organization. And we all just have this common interest of being really passionate about wanting to learn about bees and to help solve the, the problem of um, how to provide oversight for antibiotic use in, in apiculture. Okay. Um, so you bring up something that I was, I was kind of poking around on the website, uh, both in our prior conversations and, and, and in preparation for this, and I did notice that there's kind of, that there's a pretty strong laser focus for these veterinary feed directives on um, the antibacterials. Is that, is that my understanding? So things like the Varroa treatments don't apply here. Correct. So, so right now, veterinarians are only required for um, antibiotics that are medically important for, for humans. So that would be for oxytetracycline, tylosin, or lincomycin. Veterinarians are not required to access the different varroa treatments. We're not required for fumagillin, um, which is an antimicrobial, but it's not used in humans. So it's only the three right now that, that, that we're really uh, involved with. Not to hop in on top of you there, Brad, but which um, diseases in honeybee colonies are those uh, medically relevant treatments used for? Do you happen to know? Sure. So that would just be American fowl brood and European fowl brood. Those are really the only two diseases. But of course, sometimes you have a colony that's not doing well. You don't know what necessarily what the cause is. So um we may get, we're, we're trying to make sure veterinarians are prepared to recognize all the different diseases so that we don't go out and write a prescription for something that we think is European fowl brood when it turns out to actually be viral from the varroa mites. Interesting. Okay. I, I, I sort of was curious about that because I, I, I and in fact, I, I, I think there's a follow-up question here to say with, with your role and the veterinary role, and how that inter interfaces with like the apiary inspectors. Um, I assume based on what you've told me and the, and the outgrowth of that and the fact that it's here in North Carolina, there's quite a bit of crosstalk there in how that plays out. But is there like formal, the way these, these VFDs go, is there like a formal process for that? Or is that kind of something that's worked out on a case by case basis? So the VFD has to be um, written by a veterinarian and the veterinarian in the United States has to um, go out and have inspected the colony. Um, that's part of establishing, there has to be a veterinary plant patient relationship established between the veterinarian and the beekeeper, as well as the, the actual colony that the, or, or the colonies that the um, antibiotic would be for. But yes, there is definitely a lot of overlap and we strongly encourage at the consortium um, working really closely for veterinarians and apiarists to work really closely together um, because uh, veterinarians right now could really benefit from the help from the, the apiarists, the state apiarists. Um, and certainly if you know a state or provincial apiarist wants to call a veterinarian and say, I've got colonies, I think they have a bacterial disease, then that certainly can help the veterinarian um, go out and actually write the appropriate um, veterinary feed directive or prescription. Okay. Those are identical, right? When I was... No. <laughs> okay. No, it's, it's quite complicated. And so I must um, first put out there that I'm Canadian and we only have prescriptions. We don't have veterinary feed directives. But the veterinary feed directives are for certain um, antibiotics or antimicrobials and prescription is for a, a different ones. Um, but that's all sort of federally mandated. It's okay. not up to the veterinarian. It's part of the drug approval process as to what it can be, how it can be administered. Okay. I got you. Interesting. And it's not something that beekeepers would need to worry about whether they're getting a prescription or a veterinary feed directive. Like that's a legal requirement for the veterinarian to fill out, but it'll result in the beekeeper getting the medication that they need to treat their colonies. I got you. I got you. So when it comes to this kind of legal and, and, and medical or veterinary 
um, thresholds for treatment. What, what I mean, because as, as well, you know, with particularly with say European foul brood, there's such a broad symptomatic overview, like what, so we've done very little research on this personally at the, at, at the Tarpy lab, but there's a lot of interest kind of throughout the country at various, um, you know, disease ecology people that are kind of trying to suss out not just European foul brood because it's not like a single causative agent, but necessarily, um, but there's kind of community of pathogens that seem to contribute to these symptoms. But then there's a lot of variance in those symptoms. So sussing out, it doesn't seem to be as easy as like the old Koch principles, right? You know, the disease, the symptom only happens when the micro, when the, when the, when, when the pathogen is there. So mm. with, when I started kind of learning about this organization, one thing that kind of excited me was the idea of bringing in some of these medical style expertise and, and, and research paradigms I I into our entomological field. And I wonder if you might be uniquely uh, capable of speaking to that because what the lead I buried here is that you're getting this master's in epidemiology and that's on American foul brood, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like dealing with a honeybee colony, presenting with symptoms that are not specific, that's something that veterinarians, although we're not necessarily trained in honeybees, that's common with all of the species that we treat, right? Nobody comes in wearing a sign, I have disease X. So we often have to make our best educated guess as to what the most likely disease process is. And then most veterinarians like to follow that up with diagnostic tests um, to, to really help to, you start with a list of it could be, these are all the diseases it could be. You use your clinical science to kind of narrow down what it likely is. And then you use your diagnostic test more as a confirmation that you have the correct disease that you're thinking of so that you can choose treatment that's targeted to the disease going on in the patient. And so we can apply our training from cats, dogs, horses, guinea pigs, what have you, um, to, to honeybees as well. The principles are the same, even though the animal is quite different. Okay. Um, and I, should, I, I think this is probably a good time to note that uh, the NCDA runs a diagnostic for European. And Don, you can, you can I think at least from conversations, but you can confirm to me, certainly at, uh, American foul brood as well. And as Aaron has mentioned before, we're trying very hard to work on kind of rapid molecular tests that can do these for that, that same exact goal. But that's only for really one or a small number of bacteria that are, that are involved. Um, it's my understanding that with American foul brood, because we've got a single causative agent and the symptoms are so extreme, um, you can have a positive identification fairly readily, whereas it sounds like there'd be more trial and error, or as you said, diagnostic and uh, um, follow-up to kind of de determine whether or not European is in fact what's... Well, what's I would imagine the vets are probably using the ELISA tests that are commercially available in the field, Brad. That was, that. Uh, I'm dancing around that, but yes, thank you. Let's... <laughs> yeah, so we're what we're working on as researchers is developing molecular assays that are sort of more specific. Um, they give us more information than a pure positive negative, getting at some of those ideas of these causative agents at certain levels, causing certain levels of disease and things like that, which is um, the kind of specifics that a ELISA test in the field doesn't offer. And then additionally, sort of ground truthing these ELISA tests and seeing if they line up with the molecular methods and things like that. But I know that in the reality of the field, when you're diagnosing colonies, you know, today, we're using the tools that are available to us. And my understanding is that this, the commercially available kits are, are the norm. Is that right? Yeah, I think a lot of veterinarians are using the commercial kits um, or using whatever um, lab diagnostics are through the state apiary program. I think a lot of vets are, are turning to the apiarists when they especially suspect a case of American fowl brood, um, since in most locations, the apiarist should be involved in that. Um, so I think it, it's kind of one or the other. Um, I don't, I, th I think most veterinarians right now probably aren't going just off of clinical science, but um, using either the, the test kit or, or the laboratory um, that the APR program would be relying on. Gotcha. Awesome. 
So one, I, I wanted to, I don't know how freely you want to talk about your, um, your, your academic work, but sure. when I was looking into it, one thing, or, but to segue into that with this rambling question, uh, I noticed that the, that, that, that you, the, the, the consortium talks a little bit about treatment for American fowl brood and where, and I'm not much of a disease pathologist, despite Aaron's best efforts. Um, I kind of came up in beekeeping where the paradigm for that was it, you, you burn it. There's just, you call the colony no matter what. So, mm -hmm. well, I guess my question with that is, is, is that, is that culture changing somewhat or is there, is there situations where you think treatment, antibiotic treatment for like American, American fowl root is a reasonable option or yeah, so, so my personal opinion on um, American fowl brood treatment is, is yours, you, you burn it. Um, I don't think that treating with antibiotics is ever appropriate because the American fowl brood has the spore state and the antibiotics do not affect the spore states. So by treating with antibiotics, you're just gonna be suppressing the clinical disease. You don't see it great, but it's still there. Um, so I don't agree with um, using antibiotics, but one complication with American fowl brood is it's, it's um, part of the regulations or legislations in most states or provinces, and the way that it's dealt with is variable. So um, some places do not allow for any treatment of clinical cases. That's true in Ontario where I am. Um, any Ameri clinical American fowl brood needs to be um, destroyed by fire. Um, However, using antibiotics is sometimes acceptable in certain locations when it's done in more of a preventative manner. So my research that I'm working on is right now just looking at the, the prevalence and the distribution of the disease sort of over um, the geographical area as well as over time um, to see if there's any kind of correlation to environmental factors or if it's a little bit more random. Do we have disease clusters and things like that? Um, but I'm going to be starting my PhD in September. And for that, I, I really want to be looking at is there some way that we can implement a surveillance system for American fowl brood? Because with surveillance, if we can pick up cases before they have clinical signs and remove them from the population, then we're reducing the risk for everybody, right? And America, like bees are, are quite unique in our animal species in that we don't control where they go and what they eat and what they drink. Um, we don't get to have a say over that. So they can easily um, share diseases with their neighbors. And, um, and population density can be quite high, particularly in urban environments. So having a way to identify disease and remove it from the population before there is an outbreak, um, I think is really beneficial and would be um, help to reduce the risk for everybody. So that's that's um, the area that I'm really interested in. And I think the molecular tests that you guys are doing are, are wonderful because it's a great way to pick up those subclinical infections. And, and if we can pick those up and get rid of them before it becomes clinical, then we're preventing not only that colony, but from becoming clinical, but all of the colonies within the apiary and within neighbor, uh, neighboring apiaries being exposed. And to your point, Brad, it's actually worth noting that North Carolina is a little bit unique in that we offer irradiation for AFB in some cases. And that's something that maybe some of the inspectors can talk on a little more during our Q&A if anybody's interested. But um, as opposed to antibiotic treatment, that is something that um, we do have at our disposal for limited use is this irradiation of infected colonies or equipment and things like that, which is pretty cool. And it's, it's actually a, a, a ethylene oxide treatment. I knew Don would, pit, would pitch in. He definitely knows a lot more about it than I do. I've seen it, but I'm not familiar with the process at all. Yeah, we can talk about that later. <laughs> awesome. We'll hit that in the Q&A. Okay. I, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm on, I'm on the edge of my seat over here. Uh, <laughs> 
I'm actually, I'm working on another project right now, which um, kind of ties into the timely topic tonight. Um, so even though my focus is on American fowl brood, uh, I'm working on a project with Varroa treatments. And so I'm doing a, a systematic review um, and a network meta-analysis of all of the um, registered Varroa treatments. So that's sort of a a fancy way of saying kind of taking all of the primary literature studies that have ever been done on all of the registered acaricides and finding a way to go through them all without any introducing any bias um, and using statistics to develop a network of all the different acaricides so we can compare how effective they are to one another and sort of rank them from best to worst. So when you're looking at treating your colonies and you have two or three options that you can use based on the time of the year, you can then use the, well, which one is the most effective at, at killing Varroa um, or um, increasing the survivorship of the colony. So that's very cool. Exciting. Definitely put me on your mailing list for when that's published. <laughs> I would love to see that. Um, Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all of that. That was fantastic. We love getting more of that information out to the beekeepers. I am going to officially transition us into, um, if I can get it to go into our Q&A. I would say that might work really well because um, we did have a question that was suggesting a, was suggesting how you can join or get involved with the, with the consortium. Do you have like a contact or a quick and easy way people can get more information? Yeah, that? that's actually one of our inspectors who's in the chat over there. Hi, Nancy. Um, she was uh, interested to say about the how complicated it can be to join um, and how some people might choose not to join because of that. And so tell us more about how we can join and what that process is like. Yeah, so if you just visit our website, which is www.hbvc.org, um, there's uh, you can go through it all, but there's a section where you can click on to join um, and um, it sort of walks you through the registration. We do have a yearly membership. So it's $35 for professional members and $10 for students. Um, we try to keep our costs really low. And if there's any um, problems or you find you have the registration is not going well, you can always um, email us. There's contact information on the website. Awesome. Well, that's fantastic to know. Um, I'm going to point out here before I forget, because this is important information. Nancy has also pointed out that I had an error on one of my slides and the temperature threshold for formic acid has actually been lowered to 85 degrees. So the official recommendation is not to apply formic acid as a mite treatment unless the high temperature for the length of your treatment is going to be 85 degrees or less. Um, so thank you to Nancy for that, because I definitely was not aware. Um, and for anybody who's interested in any more information about the Honeybee Veterinary Consortium, their website is hbvc.org. Um, and, you know, feel free to contact us at the lab if you need any of that information. We're more than happy to send that to you. Um, we do not have any questions yet in our chat for YouTube. So I'm actually going to see if any of our inspectors are still here. Um, hey, Don, do you want to tell us a little bit more about the um, treatment for AFB that we've got available here through the Apiary Inspection Service? Well, um, we have a, a, a ethylene oxide uh, fumigation chamber where we use the, uh, it's a highly toxic material, uh, but uh, we expose the equipment, the B equipment to that uh, gas for a period of about, well, minimum of eight hours, but uh, logistically at least 24 hours. And uh, Glenn will, if there is any material that is confirmed to be, uh, uh, contain the spores or, or active vegetative stage, uh, we will culture that after, after the material has been fumigated just to ascertain that it is in fact no longer viable. And so that's an option for equipment after a colony has already been euthanized so that the beekeeper doesn't lose right. all their equipment, right? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of what we do is um, if, if someone would purchase a lot of used equipment, we, 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 uh, if there, will, there is a fee for the gas. So um, if they want to prophylactically uh, uh, assure themselves that it's uh, 
decontaminated, we can do that as well. That's awesome. And that's a major risk of buying used equipment that, um, you know, you've got these issues, especially with AFB, that, that equipment can be carrying active spores or other disease causing agents. So that's definitely something that beekeepers should keep in mind, especially if they're buying comb, but even your woodenware and things like that. If it's coming to you secondhand, be careful because you can create new problems in your apiary. Thank you for that information, Don. I'm going to check one more time. Um, do any of the inspectors have sort of their their go-to advice for this time of year for beekeepers in their region? Um, I have something related to uh, mite control and mite testing. Awesome. Bridget, can you just remind us what your region is? Um, yeah, so I kind of do um, both sides of I-77. So I cover all the areas or the counties going all the way up uh, to the Virginia border. And then I go all the way down through Charlotte. Awesome. Um, but anyway, one just word of caution, because I made this mistake my first year as a beekeeper, um, is I highly recommend that beginners, I know it's scary um, when you're trying to manage a lot of people, like you said, Aaron, they like to use the powdered sugar roll to monitor for Varroa. Um, I do recommend that if you're someone who you're trying out for the first time, um, maybe try that alcohol wash. Um, just to make sure um, both, uh, both methods use that 300 bees, half cup of bees. Um, but if you use that alcohol wash, you can take that home and you can count how many bees you are actually collecting. Um, when I was a beginner, I was going a bit overboard and I was collecting like 700 bees. So if I were doing a powdered sugar roll, I would have been like very worried about my mite control, but actually my levels were low considering the abundance of bees that I collected. Um, That's an awesome point. And something yeah. that um, for a lot of beekeepers, if you um, are thinking about monitoring your mites, you're not sure how to do any of these methods, you know, um, there are a lot of opportunities through beekeeping clubs and also by contacting your local inspector to have them help guide you through that process because it's a really mm -hmm. important part of your management and doing it right will absolutely affect your results. And that applies to having the right amount of bees. It applies to using the right amount of powdered sugar, using the right liquid for your alcohol wash, making sure your jars are sealed, etc. So definitely something worth getting right. And there are infinite ways to do something <laughs> wrong. And I can tell you as a scientist, you will always find at least one of them. So that's really awesome advice, Bridget. I appreciate that. Lewis, do you want to give us your, your elevator pitch for summer management? Yeah. No, I just wanted to follow up with some of the stuff you said earlier uh, uh, about robbing and about varroa mites. And, and uh, in both those cases, it's important to be proactive, not reactive, to, to, to stay ahead of it. It's really, uh, in both of those situations, you know, once that problem has occurred, it's really hard to reel in and uh, repair it. And uh, I think, in my opinion, I think it's, a little late in the season to start your monitoring and i've already monitored all my colonies twice this year once in march once in june and i can say with certainty that having a low mite counts in march doesn't mean you're going to have low mite counts in june i had mm -hmm. th uh, three out of 25 colonies three were above five or six percent which is terrifying for me <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so if i hadn't started my monitoring program until july or august that would have been a problem. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I want to encourage folks to get out there and, and do that work. I know it's, I know it's a little bit of work, but it really does pay dividends. You need good information to make good decisions and that monitoring is how you get that information. So please uh, get out there and do that work and lean on your apiary inspectors. If you need uh, help understanding how to monitor, if you're not sure what treatment is appropriate in your situation, uh, that's where I think we're, we can really help you out and that's where we shine. So call on us. Absolutely. David talks all the time about how very, very lucky we are to have such a robust and excellent apiary inspection service here in North Carolina. And so as a beekeeper, especially when you're talking about something so important like mite management, it's your opportunity to make good use of this fantastic resource that we have available to us. Yeah. So I would say also for most of North Carolina, you're uh, honey production is over. So your job now as a beekeeper is preparing for winter. And a lot of that means making sure you don't have a lot of parasites and yes. viruses. And that's what it's all about. So go Absolutely. ahead and start your winter management. Yes. In, here, in North, here in the mountains, we got a little bit of a nectar flow coming up with uh, everybody's chasing sourwood. Of course. And, uh, so everyone's excited about that. So uh, our 
um, you know, our prepping for winter may start, you know, in, in four weeks instead of right now. But Yeah, I think you make a really excellent point about being proactive. And that doesn't just apply to the immediate stuff like robbing, but also to your, your seasonality, you know, really with beekeeping in North Carolina, we have three major seasons, we have the flow, the dearth and the winter. And so as soon as the flow is over, you need to already be thinking about winter um, and, and how you can take your strongest, most robust colonies into winter, because those are the ones that are most likely to make it to the following spring. Absolutely. Don, do you have an elevator pitch for summer management for me? <laughs> uh, not, not anything that hasn't already been said. <laughs> So if you were going to go out and do an inspection today, Don, what's the first thing that you would be looking for this time of year? Well, get, getting to the brood nest, you'll, you'll, you'll find out whether or not they'll want enough provision. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you lift off the food, if it's heavy, you've got enough food probably. Um, you know, we looked at a couple of colonies today that uh, apparently were not queen right. Um, did what we needed to remedy that, uh, but yeah, the, the the mite inspection now is is uh, more and more uh, acute, and so uh, it's a good time to be prepared to treat. Uh, because of the weather, we have limitations as to what we can use, but uh, we do have at least uh, six or seven registered materials here in North Carolina. Uh, that, that are available for use when the, when the conditions are appropriate. And so um, let me direct this back to Lewis because I always think of Lewis as my big mite guy. Do you usually recommend to beekeepers to rotate through different products across different years? Uh, at, at least in different periods of the year. So uh, you can't rely on only one product. Um, we really need to work against resistance. We have so few tools for mites that we really have to be good stewards uh, with these miticides and protect against uh, resistance and, and uh, rotating uh, different treatments is an important part of that. So mm -hmm. in my own apiary, I will always, or so far, I've always used Apivar in mid July, but I also follow up with some oxalic acid in December Mm -hmm. I may use some apigard or, or formic acid earlier in the, in the spring. And uh, so I have, you know, different tools uh, that, I, that I use. Excellent. And um, sort of in the same vein, tell us why it's a bad idea to treat for Varroa without monitoring or without checking our levels. <laughs> so the, the, there are um, risks associated with the miticides. They're not uh, silver bullets. Yeah. And so uh, there's time and money involved. And, uh, you know, so it's important to know what your mite loads are yeah. if, it, if it warrants a treatment. And for, in, in my little operation, I have 25 colonies. I only treat those that need treating uh, in, from, from spring until about the middle of July. Mm -hmm. So I'll treat based on monitoring. Once I get to July, August, I'm going to treat everybody because I know what happens to mite numbers in August and September. And, mm -hmm. and I just don't have uh, any patience for, for mites. And so everybody get, does get treated there. Yeah. So um, on top of the stress to the colony, I think it's worth considering that if you're not monitoring your mites, you don't know if your treatment is working. Right. You have to have yeah. a mite count before and after your treatment to know if your treatment was effective. And I think that's something that, um, gets lost in the shuffle sometimes for new beekeepers. So beyond just knowing when it's time to treat, that that mite count is also going to tell you if your treatment worked, um, if That's you applied it correctly, et cetera. So really important to be doing that regular monitoring. Right, right. When yeah. somebody calls in September and they say, well, my my, I don't think my mite treatment worked. I said, well, what was your pre-treatment numbers? Oh, I didn't, you know, exactly. well, I can't really tell if it did any good or not. If I don't have pre-treatment numbers, but if exactly. you do have pre and post-treatment numbers, that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Don, you go ahead. One of, the, one of the first materials that was registered uh, for mite treatment was very effective product. We hardly ever talk about it anymore because it is no longer effective, was the fluvalinator, apistan strips. Mm -hmm. And uh, not too far from Bass, 
we uh, were uh, looking at a colony in May uh, that needed treatment. And we put the uh, Apistan strips in it. And at the time uh, it had excellent knockdown. So uh, we, would we were still using sticky boards. And uh, we went back a few days later to pull out the sticky boards and we pulled them out and we found a good sprinkling of varroa mites on it. Thought, okay, this is pretty good. We had enough time that day to uh, go into the colony and, and see how they were doing just for our own curiosity, not that it needed to be looked at or so we thought. Uh, this was about 1998 or thereabouts when the second material that was to be registered, the Kumbafos product or Checkmite was just getting on the market. When we looked at that sticky board, we thought we were doing well. When we looked at the bees, we saw mites still crawling on the comb. Uh -huh. And uh, so we switched treatments and went back a few days later after that. And you could not see the white for the amount of uh, mites that were falling on that sticky board. Wow. So that was a, a very convincing argument to monitor post-treatment Yes, during the post-treatment period. Yep. So that's been important for as long as we've been monitoring and treating for mites. That's really, that's an awesome point. Um, I do have a question. I have a question here in the chat that says when treating for mites, should you feed or supplement to help the bees cope with the stress? I'm going to let the inspectors answer this too. But um, sort of my blanket answer to questions like this is to be very careful to read the label of the product that you're applying. Right. They're very typically going to make specific recommendations about things, not just like temperature or how to place it, but also whether or not it's acceptable to feed and things like that. So the answer does depend on the product that you're using. It and does. it's very important to read that label that comes with your pack of treatment because it's going to answer questions like this for you. Yeah. And most of the treatments are not going to they are stressful, but so are the mites. So if, if the colony is that stressed to begin with, I think I'd wait till, till the treatment was pretty mm -hmm. much uh, run its course. Before. Yeah, off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure that most treatments recommend that you do not feed because it encourages the bees to interact with the treatment instead of foregoing it for, for example, a sugar water feeder. Um, yeah. especially those treatments like Apigard or Formic Pro that are delivered in a sort of patty, a grease right. patty, a pollen patty, et cetera. It's important to, the, to make the bees interact with it. So feeding is not usually recommended. I would say as, as well as the label, many of the miticide manufacturers have great websites with frequently asked questions yeah. that are, are, it has good information so that you can get the best bang for your buck from the treatment. And uh, so th those uh, the people that manufacture that stuff, they want you to have a good experience. And so they have like kind of supplemental information on their websites. So I really encourage folks to, to, to study up on that. Excellent. I have another question here. How effective is a brood break or drone cone remo removal according to the numbers to reduce your mites? So... I'm gonna hop in here. Um, I don't know if my video is showing up right now, but anyway, um, I've done a good deal of actually in a previous life when I used to do research, I did a lot of research on drone bird removal. Um, and so that answer going back and the frustrating answer is going to be, it depends on how well you do it and how often you do it. Um, drone bird removal can be really effective for someone who is very on top of their game, um, people who are on top of their schedule for it, it is um, brood breaks and drone bird removal can sometimes be really time consuming. Um, especially drone bird removal, you need to track when is that queen laying eggs in that frame, when is she, when are they capping it over so that way you can make sure that you remove it. Um, before it hatches. <laughs> before it hatches and before you give yourself a varroa problem. Um, yes. And also account uh, accounting for weather. Um, in, in my own colonies, I always try to, um, I always mark the first day I could remove that fully capped frame. So that way, in case I get a thunderstorm, in case something happens with my schedule, so where I don't make it out, um, I still have a couple days buffer to remove that frame. Um, but in terms of effectiveness, research has mostly shown that it can be relatively effective um, as long as you're doing it correctly. I always tell beekeepers, um, Scraping drone comb off the bottom of your frame is not does not make a mite treatment. It is not a mite treatment. Um, 
Same with brood breaks and just be like, well, I split it and that's going to be it. Uh, monitoring is still key. Um, and a lot of times I like to think of those as kind of tools in your toolbox. Right. So they might be really good to help keep your mite levels low throughout the year. But at some point, they probably are going to spike to the point where you might need to use a chemical treatment. That's right. my favorite point there, Bridget, is that these things that we talk about, especially beyond chemical treatments, are part of your integrated pest management plan. Mm -hmm. So you've really got to be aware of what you've got going on at that time and making a decision based on the conditions in your colony. And I talk a lot with treatment-free beekeepers. I'm very careful when I talk about mite control, not to call it just mite treatment, because there are a lot of ways to control mites. But it is worth noting that a lot of those sort of all natural or non-chemical methods are much more intensive on the management side and they require mm -hmm. time, effort, and careful uh, note-taking above all else. And so it's, it's you have to really go in eyes wide open when you're talking about trying to maintain a chemical-free apiary or something like that and consider that at some point it might be more important to prioritize the health of your apiary mm -hmm. than it is to stick with one treatment plan that you established in the winter before you knew what the year was gonna look like. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. I think one of the things about a, uh, a uh, non-chemical treatment or, or anything, we, we've talked about it already, no matter what methodology you use, you have to monitor. Yes. You just have to. In order Again, to you don't know if your promote. management's working if you're not monitoring. That is just, and no matter how strong your colonies seem or don't seem, you know, I find the same thing happens a lot with wheat colonies. Beekeepers immediately assume they have a mite problem, but there are a lot of reasons that a colony can be weak from old queens to bad nutrition. If you are not monitoring, you do not know if your management's working, no matter what your management style is. Yeah. Um, here's a more general question. If new hives are not building up, I assume this refers to late packages or nukes or splits, how can we boost them at this time of year? Depends on think, where they're starting from. Yeah, it does depend on where they're starting, whether or not you've got drawn comb. I think the simplest answer to that is to is to feed them. <laughs> yeah. Not so much that you're uh, ending up honey bound or you're ending up instituting robbing, but um, bees can't grow without consistent sources of sugar. Um, so whether you're giving them honey frames from your other stronger colonies or you're using a sugar feed, um, feeding them is, is going to be important. We're in the dearth. Um, and sometimes colonies are just not interested in growing when the flow is not on. So sometimes you have to think about combining those weaker hives into stronger colonies instead of trying to make these early summer splits. Awesome. Do you guys have any last tidbits for everybody before we wrap it up here at the end of the night monitor <laughs> monitor monitor your mites see i'm always i'm going to get it tattooed on my forehead it just says count your mites and that way anybody that talks to me won't have to ask what i'm passionate about it'll be right there at the at the front i'm not convinced you have enough room <laughs> yep definitely monitor your mites monitor it's so so important um, if a beekeeper is interested in contacting their inspector because they're thinking about monitoring their mites, what's the best way to find out who the inspector is in their region? Uh, we are on on the plant industry website, you know, NCDA and CS plant industry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, alphabetically, we're pretty far up there. <laughs> Yep, apiculture tends to be at the top. So definitely Google your NCDA apiary inspection service. They come up right at the top and that's not just my browser history there. It's really accessible, it's really easy. And if you're not sure which inspector you need to reach out to, you know, choose somebody on that list, reach out and they're gonna get you in touch with the right person. They're, they're there to help you. They're there to help you maintain healthy bees. And this is an awesome time of year to take advantage of their services. Yep. Fantastic. I'm gonna turn off the screen share. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. We really appreciate all of you coming out to our YouTube stream and to uh, attend our presentation. Um, feel free to spread the word. We're going to have this video up on the YouTube channel later tonight that's going to be available for viewing. Um, and have a great night. Have a great holiday weekend. Thanks, everybody.